Okay, it's the second game on the schedule. It's going to be at Twickenham. Charlie, you and I will both be there. In terms of the big talking point last week was obviously about Marcus Smith. He was released on Tuesday with the message from Steve Balfour to Tabai Matson. Matson revealed after on Saturday after the game. Smith was basically asked to go back, boss the game, and sort of make selection very difficult for for this week. Now, he he, he won player of the match, and it wasn't totally undeserved, but there were certainly other candidates from Harlequins who could have won that award. It, it was sort of, it was one of those where you were sat in the press box and you were chatting to other colleagues and, and one of them said, they're just going to give it to Smith because it just fits the narrative perfectly. He'd had a couple of flash moments. He had a, a couple of assists, had a nice sidestep. I'm not sure. I think there were, there were stronger candidates maybe to be given player of the match. Charlie, I know you've watched this back today or, or yesterday. What did you sort of make of the fact that Smith won that award? Was it was it sort of just written in written in the stars, or, or actually were there stronger candidates? Isn't it written in the fact that you get a you get an interview with the player of the match, and BT Sport wanted that interview because Smith was a man of the moment, which is fair enough. But That's cool. the um, the top line from that BT Sport interview, I just said he didn't really give much away as expected, but I think the main thing was he just said, "I, I just love playing with my mates, and it's really special, and I tried not to." It wasn't. It wasn't at the forefront of my mind. The release. I think that's a, a brief summary. Sorry. Go yeah. My, my, he's he's really good. I really enjoy interviewing Mark Smith. He's very honest. Um, he gives you enough to read between the lines. Sometimes after the England Scotland game, I remember speaking to him. I think we played some of the audio on the on the podcast, and he was talking about. I felt myself today in an England shirt for maybe the the first time. And actually, him and Farrell, lest we forget, there are a few obviously a few defensive lapses between them, but they they coordinated quite a lot of nice phase play against Scotland. Um, I think as far as his man of the match, I thought Danny Kerr was excellent. Scrum half, Nick David, really good at fullback. Um, Andre Esterhazen, when Quinns play well, he normally plays well. But those three back rowers, mm. uh, Jack Cunningham, James Chisholm and Tom Laude. So Bayern Matson loves Tom Lorde. He mm. always talks about how, under, how underrated he is. Or playing against his old club in Exeter as well, and just a real dog at the breakdown. Break, breakdown, sorry, but also really skillful. Those little tip-on passes. Jack Jack Kenningham's super player. Really streetwise. Really, really skillful. That um, he charged down. Um, was it Sam Maunder at the base, and mm. then actually caught the ricochet himself, which was just outstanding. I think that was his first game back from injury, Matson yeah. said after as well, which is a pretty impressive yeah, hit the ground return, running. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah hit the ground running. Running. Well, actually, well, actually, we can get into this, but actually the way that Harlequins played, didn't have a lot of possession, kicked 35 times. I'm seeing a lot of people now saying, but can, but can Marcus Smith play? Are England going to let him play the way that he plays for Harlequins? He just made a lot of really good decisions. And, and you know, Quinn's coveted territory... His chip for um, Murley's try was on penalty advantage, so you've got that mitigation. Um, they the second the second sort of long range try that Smith was involved in, and he played the scoring parts to March, and they, it was off a recovered box kick. England do that a bit; they box kick a fair bit. So you know these these are skills that are going to be um, that are going to be transferable to Test matches, hopefully. And just I thought that the I thought that he was tidy. I thought that he was patient. I thought that in those you know those long protracted kicking exchanges of which you get quite a few in test matches obviously he was he was on the whole pretty good there was one clearance where he he bumped away Harvey Skinner I think and then sort of shinned a shinned a clearance up the field that those are the sorts of things that could be really damaging against France so that will be a small moment that mm. Steve Borthwick would have would have noted um and you feel bad nitpicking these really really tiny moments don't you but because of how unprecedented the scrutiny was on this performance because and I have to say, the sort of the stir that has come with Marcus Smith being released is understandable because of how pres- unprecedented it is. Eddie Jones never released anybody to play for the play for in a club game to um, prove themselves for England. Stuart Lancaster didn't, didn't didn't do that either. So Steve Borthwick is doing this differently, which makes me still think that I would be surprised if it, a lot of this depends on how fit George Ford is. I think, mm-hmm. um, but if he is and he's ready to come back, that would still make me surprised if, if Smith was in the 23. Yeah, me too. I mean, and also, just, just to touch on your point, how many times have we said and written that in their title-winning season, Harlequins, when everyone was so you know in love with the brand of rugby that they were playing, they kicked more than anyone on average? Kicked loads. And, th- and that was a bit of a, a bit of a kind of legacy of, that Paul Gustard left there. And yeah. Smith's on the right, and I, I remember doing an interview with him, and he said, yeah, that's actually one thing that 
one thing certainly that I learned a lot from being under Paul Gustard as a coach was mm. kick pressure covered in territory that, and how important that is. France in their Grand Slam yesterday, last year when they played arguably the best attacking rugby of any Grand Slam team ever kicked more than anyone. It, it was fairly deliberate afterwards that Matson described Smith's performance as a masterclass in finding space. He was trying to sort of point out that he was you know, able to manage the game in that way. Um, mm. Smith's halfback partner Danny Kerr had a great game probably could have been player of the match and we're just going to hear a bit of audio from him now his care speaking afterwards uh, to have him around the club this week it, it's just gives everyone such confidence um, he's, he's an unbelievable player um, and I think the tactical display that he showed today was was exceptional um, so anyone questioning that he can he do that he, he definitely can um, and he's in a tough position it's, it's a tough position for him the captain in that England team is is the 10, annoyingly, for him. Um, but I think testament to his character, to how he went out there and played today, he could have tried to throw a load of things to, to show her. special things. He did his special things, then he also did the basics incredibly well. I don't know how many tackles he made, but he put his body on the line for, for the team um, and put us in the right areas. And then the magic bits that he makes look so easy, he just he does anyway. So... Hopefully, you get to see that in an England in a, in a ten shirt uh, soon, but we'll see. Now, obviously, Kerr is going to speak highly of Smith, but he also makes some fairly interesting points there. So let's let's think about selection, and I appreciate it's Monday morning when we're recording this, so we don't fully know what's going to happen in the next few days. But Charles, does Marcus Smith start for England this weekend? I would be staggered if he does, and on a so that's that's what in terms of a prediction I would be staggered if he does and on a personal level uh, I don't think he does after having not been with the squad for the past 10 days I'm not sure his performance quite for Quinn's warranted a sort of complete transplant straight into the straight into the starting team but would I have him on the bench w without a doubt because I think he can make things happen off the bench uh, well, he can make things happen on or, on or off the bench, but I think certainly in, in next weekend against France, if it is going to be tight, France have not been firing on all cylinders. They're away from home. If it is tight with 65 minutes to go and you need someone to come on and win the game, then that sort of Mitchell-Smith combo could be you know, the, the perfect tempo raiser, the perfect halfback partnership to come on and, and, and make something happen. Um, I mean, there's obviously, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that Alex Mitchell starts either at the scrum half and, and we see Jack Van Portfleet on the bench. But I, I would stick with Owen Farrell at, at, at 10. Um, he's the captain and I would be staggered, I think, if, if Smith came in to start. Charlie, what are you thinking? I'd be surprised too. Um, however, I think um, I think that's, that Ollie Lawrence is a better foil for Smith Farrell, if he wants to go back to that. And I know some people sort of um, cringe at that, but I think... Yeah, I, I would be surprised. Having having said that, um, it depends on George Ford. I would be su oh, okay. <laughs> do you bring, do you bring George Ford back after however you know he's had such little rugby is it up to 150 mm -hmm. minutes now and three three appearances since that significant injury. However, he has been in, and what we were told previously is by well, by both Steve Borthwick and and Kevin Sinfield that every moment on the training field matters. So therefore, wow. why would you? leave out a player who's going to be so f critical to how you beat France. Yeah. And and I just I just couldn't really get my head around the fact that um Steve Wolfe could take a week's training camp and go, "Yep, yeah, well we're working towards France, but actually it kind of kind of depends on how Marcus goes in this game between two mid-table premiership sides at Twickenham." The, it just it just it just flies in the yeah, face of what we've heard before a, pre Yeah, it's like, like this is how we want to play against France, but next week it's going to change slightly because we're bringing in a different fly off. Mm. That would um, suggest that they're giving up on the Six Nations and that they just purely see the last two games as development games building into the World Cup, which mm. is certainly a bit, think a bit early. Home, it's a bit early because, you know, yeah, what happens at Murrayfield on Sunday? Yeah. What, what if they Why? experiment against France and they lose and then Scotland beat Ireland the next day and they think, huh, if we'd actually just mm. stuck to what we wanted against France, we might actually still be in the mix of the title here. If Scotland win on Sunday, then there are going to be three teams going for the title on the on the, um, on the the final weekend, no matter what happens at Twickenham, because one of the two, the winner, will be in the mix with Scotland and Ireland. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 there's, you've got to have one eye, surely, on, on the World Cup, 
game, given the short notice with which Borthwick came in and how little time he's got to develop. But at the same time, he's always said it's all about the here and now, the next game, the next game, the next game. And he surely will not be making any selection decisions that are just solely with the World Cup in mind. I'd be flabbergasted if he did that. There's going to be a time in the future where England are going to have a settled 10 and 12 and 13. And we'll look back on this time and we'll have a laugh because we'll remember how this was literally all we spoke about for months and months and months. No, sorry, years. Yeah, 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 trying yeah, trying, yeah, to, work, trying to work out the, the right answer to this combination. But, I, I'm sort of leaning towards the idea that Mitchell Smith, Lawrence Slade is pretty wild. It would be very loose. Feisty. There'd be lots of mistakes, but it would be fun. I think Lawrence, I think Lawrence has been really good. Mm. I think even in the in the sort of nitty gritty stuff, defensive breakdown, things like that. Yeah. Not only has he offered that outlet as a carrier, I think he's just just been really tough there. And I think he, I maintain that he's been attacking more as a thirteen with with Slade as twelve. Certainly from set piece, been defending in the twelve channel and swapping the other way. But he's just been really important to how how England have gone. I think but, Charlie you mentioned um, Smith Farrell. Do we not think that maybe? that's been resigned to the sort of the waste paper basket as it were I mean because surely if he's going to two playmakers at 10 and 12 he's going to go Ford and Farrell yeah well I, I surely that's got to be a leading combo yeah so that would be that would be in the case that he doesn't think Ford is absolutely ready to go I would say I but think before do you not think that he'd go one of them at 10 do you think that Smith Farrell is done is, is my point no matter what no, in, is it Ford Farrell at ten twelve? And if Ford's not ready, then it's either Smith or Farrell at ten. I, I don't. I don't think Smith Farrell's done ju- just because I think it can be a good option within a game, um, and certainly, yeah, that it has given bright sparks in in phase play from set piece from mm. both of them. And I think where it's where it fell down against Scotland was a really bad defensive read from Farrell from the over the top line out prior to Hugh Jones try from mm. Tupolotu's kick, and then a, a couple of you know. A couple of big lapses in in those in those that game against Scotland that kind of um, undermined a lot of the good work that went on. Yeah, um, we could have won that game. We said that. Yeah, and th- and this is the and this is the thing with the Six Nations is you're 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 judging the on very short preparation preparation time. You're judging these games on, that swing on the smallest margins, and then and then you've won or you lost and you're out of the Grand Slam and in in England's case like hanging on to maybe being in line for the title just off the back of those really small small moments is tough.